Unless you've been living under a rock, you've probably heard the term neural network tossed around for the past couple of years. Headlines about Tesla's autopilot taking over the roads and AI agents learning against each other to improve at games such as chess and go seem to dominate the headlines. And sometimes they portray AI as some sort of black box technology with the potential to even take over the world. In today's video, we're going to explore just how powerful neural networks are by creating one from scratch. In particular, we will train our neural network on the eminence numbers data set. And even though it is not up to par with the self-driving tasks that Tesla seeks to solve, this task is complex enough to show us the intricacies of neural networks. And to add to the excitement, we're gonna be using everyone's favorite programming language, C, to accomplish this feat. So without further ado, let's jump into the code. Now, because neural networks rely on some complex linear algebra and calculus, we're going to start by creating our own linear algebra library. We'll need a basic matrix struct. In our case, we'll define this matrix struct as containing an element named entries, which points to our two-dimensional data, an element named rows, and an element named columns, which are both self-explanatory. We will also implement the ability to flatten, save, and load matrices from a file, which will come in handy when we have to handle image processing. This part of the coding is quite monotonous, so I'm going to zoom through it, but if you want to look deeper into this code, there will be a GitHub repository link in the description. Now that we have our basic matrix struct and its helper functions coded, we can dive into some of the actual functions to operate on our matrices. We will need the ability to multiply, add, subtract, apply functions to, multiply by a scalar, add by a scalar, and transpose matrices. But most importantly, we need the ability to perform dot products. When we perform the dot product, we essentially multiply the rows of the first matrix by the columns of the second matrix. Here you can see me highlighting these combinations of rows and columns. I circle row 1 of the first matrix and column 1 of the second matrix. Now I multiply each corresponding number and sum them up to get my result. The result of this combination will be in the first row and first column of our resulting matrix. Repeat this process for the remaining rows and columns. The dimensions of our final matrix depend on the number of rows in the first matrix and the number of columns in the second matrix. In the first matrix, we have two rows, and in the second matrix, we have two columns. Therefore, we will end up with a two by two matrix. Here's the C code for our dot product function. As you can see, we iterate I from zero up to the number of rows in our first matrix. In each iteration, we also iterate J from zero up to the number of columns in the second matrix. Then we store the result of our additional multiplication in the double sum. Finally, set the number designated by our index variables i and j equal to this result. Alas, we have a fully functioning linear algebra library. Here I'm testing the ability to create matrices, fill them, and add them. Here I'm testing the ability to perform the dot product. And here I'm testing the ability to transpose. Now that our linear algebra library is finished, it is time to jump into some miscellaneous things. First, let's obtain the CSV file for our image data. This file can be downloaded on the Kaggle website or by issuing the command Kaggle datasets download dash d odd rationale forward slash eminence in CSV. We also need the ability to load images and convert them to matrices so that we can feed them to our network. The CSV to images function will effectively do that by returning an array of image structs which contain a 2D matrix representation of the image and its corresponding integer label. Here I'm using the image processing functions to load the first image from the training data and print it. As you can see, our program has read the image label as one, and the matrix representation of our image very much resembles a one. And now, finally, we can begin coding the neural network. Like our matrix, we will need to create a neural network struct. 
In the struct, we have elements that represent the number of input, hidden, and output neurons, a hyperparameter to control the learning rate, and matrices for the hidden and output weights. Furthermore, we define functions to create, train, save, load, and make predictions with our network. Our network consists of three layers, an input layer of 784 neurons, a hidden layer of 300 neurons, and an output layer of 100 neurons. Our hidden layer is represented by a 300 by 784 matrix, and our output layer is represented by a 10 by 300 matrix. These dimensions are intentionally chosen so that our application of the dot product will yield a 10 dimensional vector which will represent our final probability distribution. To train the network, we call the function network train batch images. This function uses batch gradient descent for training. As you can see, we take each image and flatten its dimensions into a column vector. Then we generate an output probability distribution so that our network can adjust its weights to match the distribution using back propagation. In simple terms, we are adjusting the weights so that after training, if we were to feed the same image to the network, we would obtain the matrix stored in the variable output. This back propagation and adjustment of the weights is achieved in our network train function. First, we compute our prediction based on the current weights by sequentially using the dot product and applying the sigmoid activation function to our flattened image matrix. Then we compute our errors. The output error is obtained by subtracting our final outputs from the expected output that we fed to the network. The hidden error is obtained by applying the dot product to our transposed output weights and output errors. This last step is probably where intuition begins to break down, but bear with me, and I'll make sure to link some articles explaining the reasoning behind the mathematics in the description. The next step is our backpropagation, in which we adjust our output weights by using gradient descent. Finally, we use backpropagation to adjust the hidden weights, and then our network is trained. To test that our network is working, let's make some predictions. In this piece of code, we are loading the first 100 images and then making a prediction from the first one. One interesting thing about the network predict image function is that it uses the softmax activation function to generate an output. This function sums over all the elements with the exponential function applied in our matrix and then divides each element with the exponential applied once more by the total to generate a probability distribution. As you can see, the image represents a seven and our network accurately outputs seven for the prediction. Okay, the network correctly identified one image. What's the big deal? It probably got the other 50% wrong. Yeah, sure. See, when we train the network on 3,000 images, we obtain a 93.8% accuracy. 93.8% accuracy with one hidden layer and no convolution is pretty good if you ask me. So now that my rambling is done and we've been through the process of creating a neural network from scratch, what do you guys think? Do you think this technology has the power to change the world? Maybe you're asking yourself, will this technology have the power to take my job at Wendy's? Thankfully for us humans, I believe this technology is a means to an end. Let me explain. Some of the jobs that AI will take over are trivial. If we could have AI agents doing these jobs instead of humans, it would free up a large portion of the labor force to work on things they're passionate about. Also, the creation of new technology always brings new jobs with it. There was no such thing as a computer programmer before computers were even invented. So with the creation of AI agents, I assume there will be a large increase in the number of engineering, mathematics, AI, and robotics jobs in the near future. This is just my opinion and obviously is subject to change. But as of right now, I think we should embrace and adapt to this technology rather than dismissing it as harmful. Only through innovation and belief can we push this technology to its limits. Anyways, that's enough of me. Thanks for watching this thing. Hope you guys enjoyed and I'll see you in the next one.